Welcome back to the session, everyone. Hope all of you are back after the break. So let's resume. So guys, before the break, we implemented one pipeline wherein our goal was to copy data from the source and transfer it to a destination. Our source was blob storage account and our destination was SQL database, right? Now let's go ahead. Before going ahead, a small question for you. So guys, in order to execute that pipeline, we know we have two options. First is debug option. Second is trigger option. So guys, I want you to mention the differences between the debug option and the trigger option. So one by one, please mention the differences. So can anyone tell me the first difference between debug option and trigger option? What is the first difference, guys? Anyone in the chat? I want you guys to mention the first difference between debug option and trigger option. Okay, so I'm getting some responses in the chat. Let me read them over here. One second. Why am I not able to see the chat window? I did get some responses. Huh, I can read them now. So Harvindra has mentioned some Harvinder has mentioned a response. He has rightly mentioned the first difference between debug and trigger option. So Harvinder says with debug option, we can execute the pipeline, but we won't be able to see the input and output of every activity of that pipeline. OK, uh, sorry, we will be able to see right with debug option. So as Harvinder mentions in debug option, we can execute the pipeline in trigger option. We also we can execute the pipeline. Is this that in debug option? We can see the input and output of every activity of the pipeline in trigger option. We don't have that capability. OK, fine. Then one more student has mentioned another difference, which is that the debug button can run without saving all the changes, whereas the trigger button cannot work without saving all the changes, right? All right, so fine. Anything else? Any other difference? <clears throat> huh? Then uh, over here, I guess one student has mentioned another difference, right? Which is that in uh, debug option, uh, we have uh, the capability to only execute the pipeline right now, whereas with trigger option, we have the capability to execute it right now or schedule the execution at some other time, right? Uh, okay. So these are the main differences between debug option and trigger option. All right, let's go ahead. What I'll do is I'll save the changes. And then let's move ahead. OK, so before the break, we saw a simple copy activity from one place to another. Now what we'll do is we'll not only copy the data from one place to another, will also transform it. OK, fine. So let's see. So guys, I have my data in my source. I'll just go ahead and show you that data. Let me go ahead and let me show you the data in my source. My source, as we know, is my storage account. Let me see the data in that source. All right, this is the data. Let me show it to you over here. All right. So here you can see, guys, we have uh, three columns, movie ID, title, and genres, right? So in the first row, movie ID value is one. And have a look at the title value, OK? So you will see that for all the movies, along with the title, the name is, uh, sorry, the year is also mentioned. The year of release is also mentioned. For example, Toy Story was released in 1995, so it's mentioned. Jumanji was released in 1995, it's mentioned, so on. Like this, it's mentioned over here. Okay, fine. All right, so uh, that was about that second column title. Then for genres, if you have a look, you can see the uh, genre in which that movie falls into, right? 
so toy story fell into adventure as well as animation as well as it was made for children as well as it was a comedy movie also it fall under the fantasy category fine now let's go ahead uh over here before going ahead a uh, question one student has asked so let me address that question one student has asked that okay in a pipeline if i want to execute it there are two ways first is by clicking on the debug button second is by clicking on the trigger button we know with debug button we only have option to execute it right now whereas with trigger option we have execute to we have option to execute it right now as well as schedule the execution okay so how to do it so i'll click on add trigger button if i want to execute it right now i'll click on trigger now if i want to schedule the execution i'll click on new button over here okay then i'll click a new trigger create a new trigger as to when i want to trigger the pipeline and here you can see you can mention the settings okay you can schedule it at any time so let's say um, i want to start my uh, trigger from 17th february okay then uh, at uh, what time i want to execute it so i will say after every 15 minutes please execute it okay so you can execute it like this for example let's say uh, if you want to execute it after every one day or let's say after two days whatever then you can go ahead and mention that that after every two days please make sure that uh, you execute it on at let's say 130 pm 130 pm means 13 hours 30 minutes right 130 pm means 13 hours 30 minutes so you can go ahead and mention that over here okay so like this you can go ahead and schedule the execution so as i mentioned in debug option you have only one way to execute the pipeline which is to execute it right now whereas in trigger option you have options to execute it right now as well as schedule the execution at any other time your screen is not moving okay why boy you will have to join again as kriti mentioned as kirit mentioned that uh, <coughs> the screen is visible to others okay please join again all right so coming back to our main task so why boy is your doubt clear buddy or were you asking something else yes okay fine so let's go ahead all right so what i was saying was before the lunch break we saw <coughs> how to perform a simple copy activity we just extracted the data from somewhere loaded it into some place we did not do any transformation in between right however now let's create a pipeline wherein not only will uh, we will extract the data from some place we'll also load it at some other place but in between we'll do a transformation so we'll do a complete detail process extraction transformation loading all right now let's go ahead over here so what i will do is let me do one thing currently i have three columns over here if you observe i have three columns what i intend to do is create a new column called year okay what i intend to do over here is i want to create a new column called year okay and i want to do this one transformation over here that in the title if you guys see i have the year value mentioned so what i am thinking is why don't i create a new column called year get this year value from there and put it into this column like this similarly i will do it for all the rows okay that is the transformation that i am intending to do okay what is my transformation i will repeat again okay currently in my source data i have three columns first column is movie id second column is title third column is genres so what i am thinking is why don't i create a fourth column called year okay and in it what i will do i will try to store the year values in which that movie was released so okay how will i get it well you can see in the title column itself i have the year value mentioned so what i am thinking is why don't i take it from there and put it into my year column i'll do it for the first row similarly for all the other rows as well okay so this, this, so this is the transformation that i am intending to do okay so in my source i have three columns 
in my transformation i am intending to add one more column called year so in total guys i will have a total of how many columns can anybody tell me if in my source i have three columns in my transformation i am intending to introduce one more column so as cybel and wiki i have mentioned that will uh, make sure that i have a total of four columns with me okay i have some questions in the chat ume says can we instead use cron operations cron op so cron expressions where where do you want to use it for trigger no in data factory uh, you can't okay in data factory you can't do that okay Although you can write your separate code wherein you can write those cron expressions, that's a different thing. Okay, but inbuilt in that uh, data factory UI, you see, uh, for Tiger we did not have the that option. Okay, then <clears throat> after that, let's go ahead. Uh, I have another question from Cybel. Cybel says how to create multi. Ah, uh, so you mean multiple activities? I will show you. i think you meant multiple activities yes ha huh. i will show that to you arvind says what is the real time example of data factory i mean to see if uh, i am working on dotnet core application where i can use this data normally we would normally save through api okay so what what is the i mean what is the use case of your uh, .net application so the whole idea is this in etl that okay you take data from some place put it into one okay and let's say you have your .net application uploaded on azure okay and let's say you have your de destination also uh, destination data that is arrived in azure it will be easy for you to integrate okay but dot net application will work separately from data factory there is no inbuilt connection of your dot net application and data factory available so the only idea is that okay in uh, data factory you do etl process and then in whichever application you want to use it you go ahead and use the data that is uploaded in the destination then okay so there is no inbuilt connection between your dotnet application and your data factory it's not available but the main idea is that in wherever in whichever application you want to use it you do the etl process to data factory once the data is there in your destination then use it wherever you want does not matter if it's a dotnet application or a flask python application or any other application save user data arvind says i think it will help me when we have multiple data sources acha 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 so you are saying can you uh, instead of saving the data through your dot net application can you do the same thing just in data factory and there is no need of dot net is that what you are trying to say you have created a dot net application to save user data just like recovery data sources okay i'm not getting they are trying to say but fine uh, i'll do one thing uh, anyways over here i'll go through this pipeline maybe that will help you although i am not getting what you are trying to say you have created a dot net application called save user data how are you trying to connect it with data factory so are you saying that okay currently you are saving your user data through dot net application it would be great if with data factory you can do the same so in your dot net maybe you are having multiple data sources so are you saying in data factory can we have multiple data sources yes we can is if that's what you are asking yes we can that may be in your dot net application you have multiple data sources and from those multiple data sources you are combining data putting into one place in data factory can you do 
ओके हरविंदर से नो वी हैव प्रोडक्शन डीबी एंड वी हैव मल्टीपल अच्छा ओके सो आर यू सेइंग दैट फ्रॉम दोस मल्टीपल डेटा अच्छा बट दे आर फॉर रिकवरी पर्पस सो यू डोंट वांट टू कंबाइन देम ओके आई एम ओके इफ पॉसिबल मेंशन योर यूज केस आई नो यू जस्ट मेंशन सेव यूजर डेटा बट एग्जैक्टली हाउ you want to do it because that's a general statement right save user data anyways maybe we can discuss it in the break time or okay we can talk about your particular use case and i can help you out all right okay or if you can mention your full use case in the chat that will be great acha so you are saying in case of failure we can retrieve data from and make all of them into sync but uh, in case of failure uh, so uh, will you be manually acha like in that case you will have to first of all trigger it na that okay currently there is a failure to get the data so go it go to the uh, second data source then that can be done through code only buddy okay that sort of customization can only be done through code through your whatever dotnet application flask application okay in this uh, without code uh, ui uh, you have limitations okay so all that customization is possible through code all right fine uh, now let's go ahead guys so what we'll do uh is uh, we'll try to create a second pipeline so in the first pipeline what i will uh, what we had done was we had done a simple copy activity right wherein uh, i had just taken my data from source and put it into a destination there was no transformation that i had done in the middle okay but what i will do now is i will not only copy my data from source and put it into the destination but uh, i will also transform it in the middle how let me show that to you so in my source guys you can see i have three columns what i intend to do is i intend to create a new column called year okay there my entire goal is this one thing that i want to store the year in which that movie was released that information is already present from the title column so from the title column i'll fetch the year related information and put the year value in the year column i'll do it for the first row then the second row and so on okay that is my goal this is the transformation that i want to do so as you guys told me that okay in my source i have three columns if in my transformation i am intending to add one more column that means total i will have four columns so in the destination i will have four columns right so in my destination i will have to mention the schema so that it can handle those four columns okay so what i will do is i'll create a different table in the destination let me go ahead let me create a different table in the destination my destination is sql database there i'll create a different uh, schema okay i'll make sure that i uh, have the schema you know prepared fully because um, source has three columns after transformation one more column will be added that means a total of four columns will be inserted into the destination and uh, so my destination should be ready to you know take those four columns fine so let me mention this schema here i will say create transformed table okay and within it i will try to mention the schema for those four columns first column will be movie id i'll mention the data type of the values in movie id column which is integer then second column is uh, title i'll mention the data type of the values in the title column then third column is uh, genres i'll mention the data type of the values in this genres column and we know fourth column will be added after transformation that was your column okay for now let me make it integer only okay so whatever is the year if it's 1995 1996 that will be stored all right let's go ahead so now with this what i have done is i have made sure that in my destination i have the schema ready currently uh, my syntax is wrong let me go ahead and let me correct my syntax after that this code should work okay now the code works all right fine 
Now let's go ahead and let's see how will we proceed with creating a pipeline. So let's try to create a sort of a diagram. So guys, previously, okay, guy, over here previously I had my blob storage. Right, previously I had my blob storage. I'll just write it over here. Within my blob storage, I had a file called movies.csv. Then after that, I had my destination, which was a SQL database. I had my destination, which was a SQL database. Within it, if you remember before the break, I had a table called movies, right? I had a table called movies. So I'll just go ahead and draw it. That okay, I had a table over here called movies. Okay, this was the table. Movies. Okay, fine. So what I had done at that time was uh, with respect to my source, I had created a source link service. And a source data set. Okay, fine. Then with respect to destination, what I had done was I had created a destination link service. I had created a destination link service. And then I had created a destination data set. OK, so source link service, source data set. Destination link service, destination data set. All right, fine. That is what we had done before the break. Now, after the break, scenario has changed. What I'm intending to do is OK, I will take data from this source, transform it in the middle and that transform data. I'll put it inside this new table over here. OK, that transform data. I'll put it inside this new table. OK, I'll put it inside this new table. Uh, what was the name? Transform table. OK, that was the name of the table. It's called transform table. Transform table. OK, there's a table over here. I will have four columns in it. Fine. So guys, now what I want to do is I want to take the data from here, do some change in it and push it into this transform table. So you tell me first, can I say in my pipeline that I did before the break and the pipeline that I'm doing right now is my source the same? Previously, before the break, I was using blob storage as my source. Currently, am I using also blob storage as my source? Yes or no? Yes. So can I say guys that my source link will be same? My source link will be same. So this will be same. Okay, so I'll use the same source link. No need to for me to create again. Then before the break, the data that I used as my source was movies.csv. Okay. Then in order to transport it, obviously I had to disassemble it. Disassembly of source data happens in source data set. So I'd created a source data set. Now, after the break, also the pipeline that I'm working on, I'm working on the same file. For that, I had already created a source data set. So, guys, can I use the same source data set? Is there a need to create a new source data set? No, same one I will use. I had already created it, right? Same one. So, as Pardu says, yes, no new data set will be created. Same source data set will use. Perfect. Okay. Now, destination. So, before the lunch break, the pipeline that I built had SQL database as the destination. Right now also the pipeline that I'm building has SQL database as the destination. So that means data destination link will remain the same. OK, what will change? Let's see. So guys, before the break I had used my destination was this table called movies. OK, and I had to disassemble my sorry. I had to reassemble uh, the data because in source data set the data is disassembled that disassembled data gets reassembled in the destination data set. OK, your it was movies. OK, fine. That was done before the break. However, 
can i say in my pipeline the one that i am doing after the lunch break can i say i will have to create a different destination data set because the place in which i want to reassemble now is different so i'll create a second destination data set now because the previous one won't be used okay so source will i will source link will be the same that i used earlier source data set will be the same that i used earlier destination link will be the same that i used earlier it's just that destination data set will be different that's all okay it's just that destination data set will be different fine so let me create a new destination data set so i'll go to data factory create a new destination data set now okay so in the data set section we'll go we'll create a new destination data set uh your my destination is sql database uh, there let me create a new destination data set okay uh obviously this data destination data set is the place where reassembly will happen source data set is the place where disassembly happens destination data set is the place where reassembly will happen fine it will happen in sql database but what is the link to reach there so this is the destination link okay and the table here we want to reassemble our data into this transform table okay fine and this table is a sql table right we can call it relational table obviously the relational re table needs some schema to be there beforehand so we'll say that make sure that this schema is uh, correctly imported from the link connection okay after that click on okay fine and my destination data set has been created okay my destination data set has been created fine so one change that i did was create a new destination data set fine second change second and only change that will happen over here is now that when i'll create a pipeline previously i had used copy activity the copy activity only does extraction and loading whereas the data flow activity guys does extraction transformation and loading okay all the three so this time i will use this data flow activity that will be my second change first change was to create a new destination data set second change is to select this new activity in the pipeline previously before the break i had chosen copy data activity this time i'll choose data flow activity let me give it a name okay that copy after doing change copy after doing change fine and now let me go to settings now uh, let me mention the flow of the data in which i want to you know do the transformation so what will be the flow first i will extract the data then transform it then load it okay uh, since i have not already done that previously i will have to create a new data flow so let me go ahead and let me create a new data flow over here okay by clicking on this new button i'll create a new data flow as i mentioned in the data flow we have to do three things first extraction from source second transformation third loading into destination first let's extract from the source okay so we'll say add source here i will say source from blob okay uh your the source type as you can select if there is a data set already created you can use it if you have not created it you want to uh, you know create it right now within this one uh okay within this uh, form only you can do that okay if i choose in line you can see it tells me that okay what is the type of data set that i want to connect i'll have to create that data set but i have already created so i'll just select it okay so my source is source data set source data set as we know will remain the same okay after that you see various options over here first is allow schema drift allow schema drift with means what that let's say you are getting the data and if uh, let's say within uh, this activity there is a change in number of columns let's say you intend to get uh, let's say there were three columns previously but now suddenly there are four columns so there is a schema drift change in the schema so even if that happens it's fine i still want to go ahead and proceed okay uh, second option means what that if there is a change in the column types that uh, you are getting the uh, data let's say the first column was integer type 
but now the data that you are getting is not an integer type. Okay, so you should you will get an error if you select this option. Then it will infer the column types. It will try to match the column types, and if it does not match, you will receive an error. Fine. Then one second, let me show you that option. Validate schema. Okay. Uh, validate schema means what? That make sure that the schema is perfect. That okay. Let's say in your source you have three columns. In destination also you have three columns. Fine. What I want to do is I want to allow schema drift. Okay. I want to allow schema drift. So for my source, uh, let's say if any change is done to my source, let's say previously in my source are three columns. Now after that, after working on the source, you are end up with four columns. Even that is fine. So allow schema drift means if there is a change in the schema, allow that. Okay, skip line count means if you want to skip any, uh, you know, lines of data from the source file, you can specify it. I don't want to skip it. Sampling. What does sampling mean? Sampling means only, uh, you know, choosing certain. Uh, you can say sample of data from the overall data. So for example, let's say I have crores of rows. Now let's say I'm building this pipeline over here to see if the activities work fine or not. That means I'm just building it just for developing purposes or testing purposes. In that case, I do not want to work on data having crores and crores of rows. Okay, because it will take that much time to process. So just for testing or development purposes, I might say to data factory that from those crores of rows, just sample some of the rows and only work on those sampled rows. Okay, because anyways, uh, we are just doing this for development and testing purposes. But uh, so if your if your data set is too big and uh, you want to make sure that okay, if you want to test the pipeline not on all the crores and crores of row of source data, but only on some rows of the source data, then you can choose this sampling option. You can enable it, and then you can mention that okay, from those crores of rows. How many rows you want to get? So you can say 100, 1000, whatever. I'll disable it because anyways, my data is small. OK, so I want to take the entire data and I want to execute my pipeline on entire source data. OK, fine. Now let's go ahead. Uh, source options, everything else I'll keep the same. Everything else is fine. OK, so my main source settings was done over here. OK, now what I will do is before proceeding ahead, if you observe, in data flow activity, there is this option called data flow debug. OK, with that, what will happen is going forward, I'm going to mention another sub activity guys called transformation. After that, I'm going to mention another activity called loading. OK, so I want to know that after each sub activity, what is the input? What is the output? OK. So I want to know that currently if I have a look at data preview, it does not allow me to see the data preview. I want to know that okay from my source, how am I getting the data? Okay, because I've mentioned the settings of my source that okay, take the source data uh, that was disassembled in the source data set. Okay, but it is not giving me a preview of that. Why? Because I have not enabled this option called data flow debug. I'll try to enable it. How to do it? Just click on it. Then click on okay over here. And the debug option will try to enable itself. After that, we'll be able to see the preview now. Okay, let it. Okay, it says failed. Achha, why did it fail? Let me check. I didn't see that error message. Again, let me try to enable it. Again, I'll get an error. Let's see. OK, now it worked fine. So some connection issue might have happened at that time. Not to worry. OK, and now if I go to data preview, guys, now have a look. OK, now I'm getting this refresh button. If I do that, I'll get a preview of my source. OK, but again, I believe I should get an error over here and I'll show you how to solve it. It might not be able to fully import the data. OK, I hope I get an error so I can show you. If it still does not show you the uh, preview of the data, I'll show you how to get it. Let's just wait, it's taking too much time. We'll have to wait for maybe 10, 20 seconds. It will tell me 
if I'm able to get the data for preview or not. I hope we don't get so I can show you how to solve it. Okay, I'm just waiting for that error. Okay, again, taking too much of time. Okay, fine, I got the preview fine. I was hoping that since I didn't, did not import the projection, I might have an issue. But fine, I think because of this, I will have an issue going forward, uh, fine. So let me go ahead, let me keep it as it is, and I should get an issue going forward. Probably not over here, but ahead, and I'll show you how to solve it. Okay, it's because in the projection section, I have not imported the projection. So going forward while mapping, you know, columns from uh, source to destination, I might have an issue. Okay, let's see. Uh, now, uh, so for source, I have mentioned these settings, right? Uh, and let me do one thing. Currently, it shows me three columns, although I should have. Sorry, currently it shows me zero columns over here, although I have three. So let me do one thing. Let me go to projection and say import projection. So it will import the schema of data and you will see from zero columns shown over here. It will show you three columns. It should show you that. Uh, now can you see? Now it shows you three columns over here. Okay, previously it was not able to get this schema. Now it shows three columns. Okay, fine. I have mentioned the source that okay, in my source I have three columns. After that, what I want to do, I want to do a small transformation. So I'll click on this plus button and here for transformation, various options I am getting over here. First is join. Okay, so we know we can join multiple. Uh, uh, let's say sources. Let's say I have multiple sources. Okay. Let's say this is my first source, and below I add another source. And if I want to join them, I can go ahead and join. Okay. So here there is a plus button, and uh, you can choose various transformations that you want. Okay. So whether you want to join two tables, remember that for joining, it's not necessary that schema of those two sources of data should match. Even if they do not match, even still the joining will work. OK, conditional split. Conditional split means what? That let's say you want to split the data into multiple parts based on some condition. OK, that let's say I have a data of uh, employees. So I want to split it based on gender. That if a employee has a gender of male, I want the value. I want the data values of male employees together. And for female employees, I want it separately. OK, you can do that conditional split. Fine, then exist. Exist option over here means that let's say if you want to search for something, OK, uh, search for a specific value in the data. If that value exists, then you will get a value. You will get output of true. If it does not exist, you will get output of false. So based on the output, whether it's true or false, you can go ahead and then decide what to do next. OK, after that union. So union is similar to join. Join is used to combine multiple uh, uh, data sources. Union is also do, uh, is also used to do the same. However, for union, you need your schema to be the same. OK, for union, you need your schema to be the same. OK, so those data sources that you are combining, make sure that the schema for that is the same over here. Then lookup. Lookup means what? Uh, let's say you are trying to search for some data. So let's say you have a data of books. And you want to know how many uh, you want to know which books were written by Ch Chetan Bhagat. So you can go ahead and find it out using the lookup option. OK, you can go ahead and find that out using lookup option. After that, you have derived column. Derived column means what? That a new column will be created. This is the best for our pipeline because what we want that previously in my source, I have three columns. I want to create a new column and derived column option does exactly that. It creates a new column. OK, this is the one that we will be using. After that, you have select option. Select option means what? That let's say in your source you have 100 columns, out of which you only want to keep 60. So you can select the ones that you want. The remaining ones will be removed. Okay. After that, you have aggregate. Aggregate means from multiple values arriving at one single value. So average is a, a way of aggregation. Median is a way of aggregation. Finding maximum is a way of aggregation. Finding minimum is a way of aggregation. Finding count is a way of aggregation. So let's say you have employee data and you have a column called salary and you want to find average salary. So average is what? A way of aggregation, right? 
So if you want to apply that aggregation on certain columns of your data, then you can go ahead and do it using this aggregate option. Surrogate key. Surrogate key means what? For every row, a unique identifier will be added. So for first row, a uh, value of one. Okay, so a new column will be added, and in that you will have values that will identify each row separately. So for the in the first row, the surrogate key value will be one. For second row, it will be two. For third row, three. For fourth row, four, and so on. Okay, this is best if you want to go ahead and then later in your uh, later, you know, you want to. Uh, establish a primary key later on. So those of you are already work, working with relational databases would know that. Okay, fine. Then pivot. Okay. Now, what does this pivot do? So basically, uh, guys, you have used this in Excel also. What does pivot do? Can anybody tell me? Pivot. You have used this in Excel. Simple pivot. What does it do? Anybody? It's a simple pivot. Huh. Pardhu, uh, Akshadeep, right? All of you have given the correct answer over here. What does it do? It just converts your rows into columns. Okay, it just converts your rows into columns. Perfect. Okay, that is exactly what pivot does over here. Converts your rows into columns. Okay. Then, uh, on the other end, if you want to do the other way around, let's say you want to convert columns into rows, you will choose unpivot option. OK, then you have this window option over here. OK, so if let's say if you want to perform calculations across a set of rows that have somehow related to the current row, like running totals or moving averages, in that case, you will choose this window option. After that, you have rank. OK, so let's say you want to assign a rank to each row based on the value in a certain column, like ranking sales data from highest to lowest. You can use this option. After that, you have external call. So let's say you want to invoke an external process or a service which might be a custom piece of code or a call to an external API. In that case, you can choose this option. After that, you have cast. Cast means what? Convert the data type of a column, like converting a text column to numeric column. Okay. So you can go ahead and use that. After that, there are various options. Then you have flatten. So flatten is to convert uh, JSON data into rows and columns. Okay, you can convert your XML data into rows and columns. Okay, so in flatten you will have that option. I'll just show that to you. If I click on it, here you can see. Uh, one second. I should get an option over here for flattening. Achha. I'm not able to see data type, but fine. Uh, if you want, I'll show you a pipeline of this. Okay, basically just remember flattening is used to convert your, uh, you know, JSON data or XML data into rows and columns. Okay, fine. After that, you have parse. Okay, now what does this parse option do? So parse option basically converts data from a string format into a structured format. For example, if you have a string that contains JSON, then parsing it would turn it to a, turn it into a structured JSON object that can be easily accessed and manipulated within the data flow. If I just show to you. Here you can see options for JSON, delimited text, XML. OK, so let's sometimes what happens is uh, your. Uh, you have JSON values, but in the form of string. OK, so you might have something like this. Let's say you have a string within this. You have written a JSON value. Let's say something like address. Mumbai. Then uh, let's say age 24. Okay, so this is okay. It contains JSON type of data, but in a string. If you want to convert it into a standard structured JSON, then you can go ahead and do it with the help of parse. parse. Okay, in that case, it will be converted into a structured JSON format. OK, similarly, if you want to, let's say you have XML data in string, you want to convert it into a, a structured XML format, you can go ahead and do it with help of parse. OK, so parse converts your string to JSON, string to XML. What if you want to do the other way around? Let's say you want to convert JSON to string or XML to string. You can use stringify option. After that, you have various options, filter, as we know, for filtering 
based on some condition sorting let's say you want to sort values of a column alter row as the name suggests you can do a change in the column okay then assert so it's used to check whether uh, a value with that particular condition exists or not okay if it exists then you will get true if you do if it does not exist you will get false flow let flow let means what if you want to make the data flow reusable okay it's called flow let so just like for example uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with python in python if i want to make my code reusable i convert it into a function right similarly let's say we have a data flow i want to make it reusable okay that uh, my data flow um, you know can be reused again and again in that case what i'll do is i'll use this concept of flow let okay fine then after that you have the last option sync sync is used to mention the destination related details all right so these are the various options however in our uh, exercise we just need this option called derived column which is used to add a new column so i already have three columns with me what i want to do is i want to add a new column over here called year okay i want to add a new column called year okay i'll give it a name saying adding your column adding your column what will be the source okay in this activity what will be the source the source will be this sub activity is called source from block the same thing i will mention over here okay that i'll get the data from this sub activity called source from block all right and after that i want to create a new column here how will i create i want to create it dynamically so here there is an option to open expression builder okay here i'll just go ahead and mention the code that will give me values for the year column what i want to do is i want to do something like this over here that let's say uh, i'm just thinking uh, should i just work on us huh, fine let me do just this that i will take my uh, title okay i will take my title and if you have a look at the title guys okay if you have a look at the title let me go ahead and let me show you that data first of all i'll just go ahead and show you that data here it is if you have a look at the title can you see guys in each row the title value is available in the last six characters can i say that sorry not tight i mean the year value guys the year value is available in title column in the last six characters yes or no year value is available in the title column in the last six characters for every row you can see that okay for each and every row you can see that over here so i will say start from right in the title column and for each value in the title column give me the six characters okay so it will give those last six characters to you okay fine so it will give me something like this okay if i take the last six characters from here it will give me something like this let's say for the first row it will give me this and so on for the other rows guys over here the year information is present in middle only so can i say wiki that this opening bracket and closing bracket needs to be trimmed out yes opening bracket and closing bracket needs to be trimmed out okay fine so i will say trim okay that from this from these six characters you get trim the opening bracket and closing bracket trim the opening bracket and closing bracket and the value that you get i want to convert it to a integer whatever value you get please convert to a integer okay that's it i will save the file so save the code is what i mean and let me have a look at the data preview so i'll go ahead click on refresh button and with that one second let me open it up again i'll click on refresh button will that i will have a way to look at the data preview let's see am i getting the year column values correctly made or not and have a look from title column i tried to make year and you can see i'm having um uh, you can see over here it's exactly as i want i will open it up again i closed it by mistake let me open it up again let me have a look at data preview and you will see over here the year column values are correctly made 
let me expand this. You can see the your column values are correctly made exactly like I wanted. OK, exactly how I wanted. It's just a preview. It's not entire data, just the preview. So in case, let's say if a title had a year 1984, that same value would have got written in the year column then. OK, fine. So there's what I want. Okay, let me cancel this. Fine. So in my source, I had three columns. I added one more column. So total, I have four columns now. Now those four columns, I want to send it to my destination. Destination means sync. So I want to send it to my sync or destination. Fine. So over here, I'll just choose the destination data set. This will be my new destination data set, not the destination data set that I used before the break. I'll use a new destination data set. Let me test the connection. And after testing, let me have a look at the data preview. Let's see whether I'm getting those four columns correctly or not. OK, it seems I'm not getting the movie ID column. Why? Because the mapping is not done correctly. So let me do mapping correctly. Uh, your movie ID, I think seems fine. OK, now let me refresh. I should have four columns. That movie ID column was not shown. Let's see. Ah, now I can see it. OK, movie ID column, title column, genres column and your column. So your column is inserted exactly like I want over here. OK, like this in the same activity, guys, you can add more columns. OK, by clicking on the plus button, just like how I inserted the your column, you can insert more columns by clicking on this plus button over here. OK, if I click on it, then you will see I get an option called add column. You can add a new column if you want. Fine. So now I'm ready. Uh, I'll just go ahead and save all the changes. OK, close all of these windows that were open. Go to the pipeline that I just created. Here I created data flow activity within this. If I double click on this, you can see we have sub activities. I repeat again. I close everything. Go to my pipeline. Here I just had one activity called data flow activity. Within this, I'll double click and go within this. Within this, I had three sub activities as to what I want to perform. OK, fine. I'm fine with everything. So I'll go ahead and what I'll do is after going to my pipeline, I'll just ask it to execute the pipeline. Let me go ahead and let me execute. I'll do that by clicking on the debug button. And it will try to execute it. So from our blob storage, we got our data. OK, from blob storage, we got three columns. Then we made a transformation. We inserted one more column. So now in total, we have four columns and those four columns we are pushing to the pu pushing to the destination. My destination is SQL database. So those four columns we are put pushing to SQL database. Let's see if that works. We'll just go ahead refresh. Uh, the pipeline got succeeded. Let's uh, validate it ourselves. So what I will do is I'll have a look into my destination, which is SQL database. I'll say please give me all the data from this table. Hopefully I have values inserted inside of it now. OK, let's check. Have the values entered into destination? Yes, they have. OK, so you can see that over here. I have the four columns inserted. Fine. So this was just to show you how your data factory works. It is used to do ETL process. ETL stands for extract transformation loading. OK. And uh, this is just a simple demo of how you can work with it. OK, here we can do lots of other activities. OK, but we'll stick to these exercises for now as we have to go into other services. So this was the overview of this was the overview of data factory service. Guys, is the overview clear to everyone? Overview making sense? Any doubt? 
this was the overview of your data factory service. Yes, clear. OK. Fine. Now let's go ahead. And what I will do now is I'll move on to my next service, OK, which is Synapse Analytics service. We know in Synapse Analytics, what can we do? We can do ETL just like how we can do in Data Factory. Plus within it, we can also perform analysis if we want to. OK, let's go ahead and let's see how it would work. So we'll go ahead. We'll see how it works over here. So what I will do is let me do one thing. Uh, in this scenario, I will just go ahead, create a Synapse resource. So let me go ahead and do it. Let me create a Synapse resource. I'll click on the create button over here. Fine. And now when I click on the create button, you can see a form comes up uh, that I have to fill. So let's go ahead and let's fill the details in the form one by one. So let's go ahead and let's do that. So the first in the first field in the form over here is subscription. OK, we know subscription is nothing but the uh, it holds the details. It is the billing unit. OK, uh, and it holds the details of all of your resources that you have created. So any charge, any money that will be deducted will be deducted from this subscription. Like that, if you have a second subscription in your account, you can use that. OK, if you want your money to be deducted from that subscription, up to you. Oh, now next option resource group. So we are creating this synapse resource. It has to come under some resource group. So we'll make sure that all the resources that we created today were in this resource group called webinar RG. So this. Uh, synapse resource will also come under that resource group. Then manage resource group. So what synapse does is. Uh, it might want to create some resources on its own. OK, uh, going down the line, it it might. Uh, let's say you ask it to do something and uh, you have asked it to work on a resource and that resource is not created. So Synapse will create that resource automatically and those automatically created resources will come under this group called manage resource group. OK, what I'm saying is currently let's say you ask Synapse to do a task. And in order to do that task, let's say the resources that are available are not there. So what Synapse will do is it will create those resources and those automatically created resources by Synapse will be put into this resource group called manage resource group. If you want to give it a name, you can. OK, or if you keep it empty, then Azure will assign its own name. Fine. Then the Synapse resource that we are creating, we need to give a name to it. So let's go ahead and let's give it a name. I'll call it test. Webinar Synapse. OK, then the region in which my resource will lie. So I'll select East US region only. OK, before we go ahead, Vibo has a doubt in Vibo says in Azure Data Factory there was Synapse. Acha, you mean in the pipeline section? Huh, here. Here what you see is here you will see activities. As I told you now that in Synapse we can perform analysis. So let's say you perform analysis in a notebook and that notebook you want to execute it as a pipeline that OK after copying the data into the destination do a NL, uh, OK uh, run the code in this pipeline so you can do that also. But that code has to be written inside Synapse notebook. So first you'll have to create Synapse OK write code in the notebook of Synapse. You might be familiar with the term notebook if you are a Python developer. OK, Python developers work with these notebooks a lot. OK, so here you have options. That OK, uh, after copying the data, let's say if you want to run the code in the notebook, you can. OK, fine, let's go ahead. After that, it says, uh, remember guys that Synapse needs a storage account to be created and that storage account was had to be Gen 2 storage account. OK, Synapse needs a storage account to be created and that storage account has to be a Gen 2 storage account. So luckily we have already done that right before the break. So we'll say that OK, I'll get it from my subscription. The storage account that I created was test webinar storage. OK, within it I had a container called basket. So this will be my primary basket. OK, or I should say my primary container where all of the communication will happen. Obviously, if you want to do the communication in a different container of your storage account, you can. I'll show you how to do that. But 
while creating synapse it requires the storage account and you need to mention the primary container or uh, into which all the communication will happen so if synapse wants to upload data to somewhere it will always upload it in your storage account over here okay and inside this primary container called basket the one that we had created before the break fine after that let me go to the uh, click on the next button and here there are a lot of fields let's go and let's understand those fields so for authentication over here uh your you need to select how you want to authenticate or log in into your synapse workspace you have two options first option is called use both local and microsoft enter id authentication okay you have seen this field previously also guys same options you had seen previously okay where the first option called use lo both local and microsoft enter id authentication means i will not only use the username and password option but also i'll use a extra layer of authentication through microsoft enter id whereas in the second option you will not use username and password you will only use microsoft enter id authentication in the first option you will use both username password as well as microsoft enter id authentication fine so we'll try to use both uh, let's go ahead let's mention a password for the same okay fine after that you have an option it's called allow network access okay to um, your data lake storage gen2 account okay currently it is disabled because uh, uh, in gen2 uh, by default there is network access uh, given okay fine all right next then in the next field it says double encryption using a customer managed key okay so as we know there are two type of keys microsoft managed key customer managed key microsoft managed key is like your bank locker there the key is ma managed by the bank customer managed key is like your locker in your wardrobe where key is managed by you okay so if you want to say that okay so in bank locker guys in bank locker do you know there are two type of keys given first key is kept by the bank second key they give it to you and only if they insert two keys then your bank locker opens okay in certain bank locker systems they have that okay they will give you two keys first will be kept by the bank company second key will be given to you and if you insert both then only something opens okay so if you want to have that double encryption you can do go ahead and do it fine all right uh, however i don't want to have that double option over here fine let me go ahead let me click on the next button and here there are more fields in the form let's understand those fields so here the first option is managed virtual network you have two sub options enable and disable if i enable it then you will create a virtual network that is managed by azure synapse a virtual network is like a private network in the cloud where or your synapse workspace and related resources are isolated and secured However, if you ch choose the disable option, then uh, you are asking to not create a managed virtual network. So your workspace will be less isolated from other Azure services. Okay. So if you want more isolation, you can click on enable option. If you want less isolation, just choose disable. Okay. Fine. Uh, then firewall rules. Do you want to allow connections from all IP addresses? Yes. Okay. If you do not want to allow it, up to you. I'll choose to allow it. Fine. Then minimum TLS version. TLS stands for Transport Layer Security, which is a protocol used to establish secure communication between your client applications and the users. Okay. So let's have a client application called Amazon website. I have a user, let's say me. How will a secure communication happen between me and the client application? Through TLS, Transport Layer Security. Okay, anyways, here it is not asking me to choose the any version because it has by default chosen the latest version. Next, tags. Tags, as we know, are like sticky notes. If you want to assign it to your resources, you can. It allows you to search for your resources in a better way. After that, I'll go ahead and try to review all the details since I'm fine with all the details over here. Okay, let me go ahead and uh, let me create it. With this, a Synapse resource will be created. What will happen? 
a synapse resource will be created over here. Let's just wait. Just wait for around two minutes or so, and that synapse resource will be created. All right, so just uh, to ask a question over here. So guys, what is the difference between data factory and synapse? Can anyone tell me the difference in the chat? What is the difference? Anyone with the difference between data factory and synapse? Anyone? What do you think is the difference? Satyavan says, uh -huh. so Satyavan is trying to say that in data factory, I can do ETL only, whereas in Synapse, I can do ETL plus analysis. Right. Okay, Prabhu also says the same. Even Vicky and Mahindra have said the same, that in data factory, I can do ETL only. In Synapse, I can do ETL plus analysis. So data factory is like a knife, whereas Synapse is like a machete. Okay. So all the things that you can do with a knife, you can do with a machete also. But the things that you can do with a machete, you cannot do with a knife. That means all the things that I can do with a data factory, I can do with Synapse also. But there are some things that I can do with Synapse, which I cannot do with data factory. Okay. So as I said, data factory is like a knife, whereas Synapse is like a machete. Even Saibal has mentioned the same in the chat over here. Fine, so we'll see what analysis we can perform. Uh, till this is creating the synapse resource, let me teach you a theory over here. So guys, when you will open up synapse, you will realize that in synapse, we have an option called pools. Pools are nothing but group of computers. Okay, pools are nothing but group of computers that can help us to, uh, you know, do parallel processing. So let's say uh, I want to do a certain task. Okay, let's say your office has given you a project. What will be better for you if that project is done by you individually or if that project is divided among multiple people and you do that project in a group? Which scenario is better? For completing the project faster, which scenario is better if you do the project individually or in a group? Which scenario is better, guys, for faster completion of project? Obviously, in a group, right? As Pardu, Pankaj, and Vikya have mentioned, right? And even Satyaban and they have mentioned that it's better if I have a project assigned by the company. It's better that instead of me individually doing it, that project is assigned to multiple people in a group. That way, the process can be done faster. Similarly, let's say I have an analysis job, okay? And that needs to be done faster. So it's better if I divide my analysis job among a group of computers. Okay. So th those group of computers, uh, that group of computers is called a pool. Okay. So in Synapse, you can create many such pools. Okay. So first type of pool that you can create is SQL pool. Second type of pool that you can create is Spark pool. In SQL pool, also you have a group of computers working. In Spark pool, also you have a group of computers working. Let's see how. So, what will happen in SQL and Spark pool? What is the similarity and what is the difference? Let's see. So, let's say I have a group of computers wherein one computer will be my master computer or my head computer, and the other computers will be my slave computers or worker computers. Let's say you have a group of computers. Okay, so where you are, this in the middle is my master computer. Okay, and surrounding it, I have my slave computers. All right. So let's say whenever a task is being given, it goes to the master computer, and the master computer then decides based on the task that in how many parts it should divide into, to whom to divide into. Okay, so accordingly it would go ahead and divide the task into 
its worker computers or its slave computers. Okay. The same thing happens in SQL pool, same thing happens in Spark pool. But what is the difference? Guys, in SQL pool, there is no replication of data happening among the worker nodes. Okay. So let's suppose I have four uh, or let's have eight rows of data. One, two, three. Okay. Let's have eight rows of data. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Let's say the first two rows have gone to the first slave computer. Next two rows to next slave computer. After that, next two rows to another slave computer. And after that, the last two rows to my last slave computer. Okay. Here you can see, guys, in SQL pool, we follow a, a, a we follow an architecture called MPP. In MPP, there is no replication of data among the worker nodes. What I mean by that is, we know that, okay, in this slave computer, first two rows have gone. What if something happens to the slave computer? At the end of the day, it's a computer. It might get corrupted or something, right? What if anything happens to this computer? Then can I say the two rows into it will be lost? Okay. This is what happens in MPP architecture. This is the drawback of MPP architecture. MPP stands for Massively Parallel Processing. MPP stands for Massively Parallel Processing. And the disadvantage of this is here, there is no replication of data among its worker nodes. Okay, this is the disadvantage. So this is what happens in Spark pool, which follows MPP architecture. Now, let's talk about Spark pool. Okay, so in SQL pool, we have MPP architecture. In Spark pool, what do we have? In Spark pool, we follow architecture called Apache Spark architecture. Okay, we follow architecture called Apache Spark architecture. Then what happens? You find you divide the data among your uh, worker nodes, but what will happen is the data inside of the worker nodes will be replicated in at least one external worker node. Okay, so what could happen is, let's say I have data in this worker node one and two. I'll make sure that that particular data is replicated in at least one other worker node. Similarly, I have data in this worker node three and four. I'll make sure that that particular data is replicated in, replicated in at least one other worker node. I have data in this worker node. I'll make sure that that particular data is replicated in at least one other worker node. Okay, let's say something like this and this. Then I have data in this worker node. I'll make sure that the data inside of it is replicated in at least one other worker node. So let's say if something happens to this worker node inside out of it, we had main data one and two. Now, uh, where will I get one and two from? This computer has gone corrupted. Well, we have a copy of that. The first row was copied over here, second row was copied over here. So this type of replication is better, right? This is what happens in Apache Spark architecture, which is done in Spark pool. Okay, so in SQL pool, we follow MPP architecture where there is no replication of data among its worker nodes. In Spark pool, we'll follow Apache Spark architecture. Okay, so just to recap over here, guys, just to recap over here. So in SQL pool, you have two types of pools, SQL pool, and you have Spark pool. Okay, so guys, in SQL pool, which architecture is followed? What is the name of that architecture, anyone? Can anyone give me the name of that architecture in SQL pool? It starts with M. MPP, right? As Satyaban and Pankaj Kumar, Ketaram, everybody is saying. Okay, in SQL pool, we follow something called MPP architecture, also known as massively parallel processing architecture. Massively parallel processing architecture, MPP architecture. On the other hand, in Spark pool, we follow something called Apache Spark architecture. Okay. What is the difference between the two architecture? There are a lot of differences. However, I mentioned uh, one difference. What was the difference between the two architectures? 
in mpp architecture what happens in spark pool architecture what happens okay so mahendra and satyabana saying and even alim has mentioned the same that in mpp architecture there is no replication of data among the worker computers okay worker computers computers are also known as nodes so if ever you would see this term nodes it means computers only okay among the worker computers or worker nodes one and the same so in mpp there is no replication of data among the worker nodes okay whereas in apache spark architecture the data inside of a computer is replicated in at least one other computer is replicated in at least one other computer okay fine so as i mentioned guys in synapse you will be able to create two types of pools first is sql pool second is spark pool okay i have mentioned the differences over here now guys in sql pool okay that means a group of computers you know pool means a group of computers so in sql pool yes you have a group of computers but on those computers you can only write code in sql language can only write code in sql language okay whereas guys in spark pool you can write code in uh, sql language in uh, python language in scala language in java language and so on like that there are two to three more languages that are supported okay so these are the differences between sql pool and spark pool yes both are pool of computers only that means both are a uh, group of computers pool is nothing but a group of computers so in sql pool you have a group of computers in spark pool you have a group of computers but what is the difference between sql pool and spark pool in sql pool you follow something called mpp architecture in spark pool you follow something called apache spark architecture in M sql pool we know we follow mpp architecture and in mpp architecture there is no replication of data among the worker computers whereas in apache spark architecture there is a replication of data among the worker computers then in sql pool we can only write code in sql language whereas in spark pool we can write code in multiple languages like sql python scala java and so on okay fine now uh, let's go ahead i believe my synapse resource should have been created by now yes it is let me go ahead and go to that resource i'll launch synapse studio and here guys i will show to you as i mentioned in synapse you can do etl plus analysis both okay just like in data factory you can do etl in synapse also you can do etl the better thing about uh, synapse is apart from doing etl you can do analysis also let me show to you i'll go to integrate section create a new pipeline and have a look is this the exact same ui that you are able to see in uh, your uh, data factory exactly the same yes data factory similar thing you are able to see same thing here also you can perform copy data activity there also you can perform copy data activity so you can see ui is the same okay almost very very similar 99% similarity fine so as i mentioned in data factory you can do etl in synapse also you can do etl okay in synapse also you can do etl fine let me go ahead let me remove this okay but the better thing is uh, you can uh, uh, do analysis also so let me go ahead and let me do analysis so what i will do is uh, here i will just go ahead go to uh, my data and here i will have uh, two sections first is data that i created within the synapse workspace second is the data that is there outside synapse but synapse is linked to that outside storage so if you remember synapse is by default linked with storage account right 
right? It's linked with storage account. So I'll go to the link section and you can see it's linked with a Gen2 storage account. Okay. And here we already have some data inside of this. I already have some data inside of this. Let me try to perform analysis on it. I already have some data called movies.csv. So I will say, please, I want to run the uh, code using SQL. Okay, and please give me the top 100 rows. And you can see when I click that option, automatically a code is written. And I'll just go ahead and run it. And uh, you can see over here what has happened is I'll get a result shortly. I should get a result over here shortly. And here you can see it. Currently, the issue is the column names were not uh, correctly identified. So I can do a change in my code. Okay, I will say header underscore row equal to true. That means treat the first line of the file as a header or treat the first line of the file as column names. After that, I will run my code. And now the output should be exactly as per I want. So you can see I can do this analysis. Now I can do that group by operation and all of that. Okay, whatever I want to do, I can go ahead and do it. Okay, fine. Now, uh, let's learn more. Up till now, guys, if there are any doubts, please let me know. Any doubts whatsoever? Any doubts? Okay, fine. I don't see any doubts. So we'll do one thing. Uh, since almost one or 30 minutes have passed after the break, let's take a short uh, tea break. Okay. We'll be back and uh, after the tea break, we'll come and we'll see more things. I hope up till now it is making sense to everyone and uh, we'll come back after the tea break. Okay, let's take a tea break up till 3.40, I believe. Okay, since we are ahead of our schedule, let's take a 18 minute tea break. After that, we'll be back and we'll study more about Synapse. Okay, I'll show you more things about Synapse. Abhishek has a doubt. Can you clarify if there's separation for resources created? Uh, over here, Abhishek, if I go to my resource group, if I go to my resource group, the one that I created today, Webinar RG, there you can see the resource for your Synapse is over here. For Data Factory, it's over here. So internally, whatever is done in Data Factory will be stored in this resource. Internally, what is done in Synapse is stored in this resource. Is that what you are asking? So let's say I created some pipelines in Data Factory. It will be stored over there in data in this Data Factory. If I create any pipelines in Synapse, it will store it will be stored over here. Are we using different data source? Uh, achha, let's try to understand. So, uh, Vaibhav, uh, in uh, Data Factory, was there an option to connect to any uh, default storage? No, there was no such option. It was dip it, it dependent on me. What was my source data? Okay, and everything. Okay, basically, basically, what I was saying is, in Synapse. Sorry, in Data Factory, there was no need to connect to any storage. But in Synapse, there is a need. While creating Synapse, it will ask you an option to connect to your storage account. Okay. So by default, uh, it will need to connect to the storage account. But just like in your Data Factory, your source and destination of pipeline could be anything. Okay. Don't confuse it with pipelines. Okay. Don't confuse it with your pipelines. If you are asking about the data source in pipelines, are you asking about that way? Data source in pipelines. Don't confuse it with pipelines. Just like in data factory, our source and destination of pipeline could be anything. In your synapse also, our source and destination of pipeline could be anything. It's just, in, it's just that in data factory, uh, there is no need to connect to any storage account. Whereas in Synapse, it does have a need to connect to storage account. Why? Because mostly people store their data in storage account. And if they store their data in storage account, if they want to do analysis on it, then Synapse can do it in a much faster way. You can see how it did it. 
Okay, I will go ahead and again show to you how it did it. Okay, again, I'll show to you. So what to do? Go to data section. As I mentioned over here, here there are two tabs. One is workspace, second is link. Workspace means the data that you create within the Synapse workspace. All of that data. Let's say I create a table. Okay, so that will be shown over here. And I'll show you how to do that, how to create that table. Then what if that data that you have uh, that you want to work on is not created within Synapse, but it's connected outside of Synapse. Then you will have to go to link section. And we know there is by default automatically a link between my Synapse and the Gen2 storage account that we created. Okay, so I'll just go ahead in my Gen2 storage account. Let's say I want to analyze the data inside of a file. I'll go to that file. Okay, I'll go to that file over here and right click on it. And here there is an option. Okay, to load it into SQL code or to load it into a Python notebook. Whatever. Let's say I want to load uh, load it with the help of SQL code. When I click on it, automatically the code is written for me. All I have to do is just run the code. Here I've just thus done a simple analysis that give me top 100 rows. You can do more analysis. You can do that group by operation. Then you can apply order by then. Okay, you can do all that operations that you are able to do normally. So just like in SQL code, how would you do those analysis operations? You can do it over here. OK, there is a lot more to learn about Synapse. However, in this overview that I gave to you, what doubt you have? We had already declared earlier that in Data Factory, you can just do ETL. In Synapse, you can do ETL plus analysis. And you can see I am able to do analysis. Currently in my output, you can see column names are not properly read. So I'll just do a change in my code. I'll say, please treat the first line of the file as a column name. So I'll say header underscore row equal to true. Okay, that's it. I'll just go ahead and run my code. And now the result is as per my expectation. Here I've done a simple analysis to get the top 100 rows. You can do more answers. You can do order by group by. You can perform. You can use those where clauses and all of that. Okay, Abhishek says I noticed that all the resources for data factory and synapse have been created. Which resources are you talking about? See, buddy, this is a separate resource. This storage account is a separate resource. I was OK. Storage account is created over here. I could use the data in my storage account in data factory. I can also use the data in my storage account in Synapse. Similarly, my SQL is over here, although I have not shown you how to work with SQL database in Synapse. But I can use the data in SQL Server in Data Factory. I can also use it in Synapse. So irrespective of where you can store your data, you can work with it in Synapse or Data Factory. OK. Fine. All right. If there is any other doubt in overview, let me know. Fine. Uh -huh. So Teban, what we'll do is uh, first we'll complete Synapse. So we'll take a short break. After the break, we'll be back. We'll complete a little bit about Synapse, then we'll move on to data bricks. Okay. Fine. So let's do one thing. Uh, let's take a 15 to 16 minute break and we'll be back shortly. Okay, till then I'll just keep my mic on mute.
Welcome back to the session, everyone. Hope all of you are back after the tea break. So let's resume. So guys, uh, we have already completed the overview of data factory service. Now we are trying to understand more things about Synapse service, right? So let's go ahead and let's revise what we have learned up till now with respect to Synapse. We know that in data factory, I can just perform ETL. Whereas in Synapse, I can perform ETL plus analysis, right? Now, any other difference? Uh, let's try to understand. Okay, sorry. This is the only difference. What I mean is, what are the new points that I uh, explained to you with respect to Synapse? Okay, we know the difference between Data Factory and Synapse. Now, diving more into Synapse now. Okay, fine. So in Synapse, I explained to you that the analysis will be done on a group of computers called pool. Okay, we have two types of pools. First, we have SQL pool. And second, we have Spark pool. So I said that in Synapse, we will be able to do analysis on pool. First is SQL pool. Second is Spark pool. Okay, guys, what is the difference between SQL pool and Spark pool? Can anybody give me the difference? Anybody? There were some differences that we mentioned. Anybody with the difference? Okay, so Pardu says, huh, okay, Pardu says that in SQL pool, you can only write code in SQL language. Whereas in Spark pool, you can write code in SQL language plus Python language plus Scala language plus Java language. Okay, one difference. In terms of languages, it seems that SQL pool supports only one language. Spark pool supports multiple languages. Fine. Second, Rajkumar says in SQL pool, we follow something called MPP architecture. In Spark pool, we follow something called Apache Spark architecture. Right? In, SQL, in MPP architecture, which is what happens in Spark pool, there is no replication of data among the worker nodes. Whereas in, sorry, in, uh, MPP architecture, which is what happens in SQL pool. Sorry, I spoke the inter incorrect term earlier. I repeat the differences again. First difference between SQL pool and Spark pool was given by uh, Pardu. He mentions that in uh, SQL pool, there is only support for one language, which is a SQL language. Whereas in Spark pool, we have support for multiple languages. Then Rajkumar has given the second difference. Even Satyabhan has mentioned the same that in SQL pool, we follow MPP architecture. In Spark pool, we follow Apache Spark architecture. Okay, fine. Then after that, what next? So these are the main differences, right? Now, Let's go ahead and let's see what's next about it. So in SQL pool, guys, remember in SQL pool, there are two types of SQL pools that you can create. First is something called built-in SQL pool. There are two types of SQL pools that you will deal with. First is built-in SQL pool. If you remember while creating the synapse, we had mentioned the username and password of this built-in SQL pool. Okay, we had mentioned the username and password of this built-in SQL pool. Then second is something called dedicated SQL pool. So built-in SQL pool is also known as serverless SQL pool. Let's go ahead and let's see the difference. So we know the difference between SQL pool and Spark pool. But now I'm mentioning that SQL pool is of two types, built-in and dedicated. Okay, fine. And remember guys that built-in pool is automatically made for you. Automatically made for you. When you are working with Synapse. Okay, you don't have to make it. Whereas dedicated SQL pool has to be manually created. And your spark pool also has to be manually created. Okay, fine. So uh, we were talking about Synapse. We know how uh, Synapse is different to Data Factory. 
in data factory we can just do etl in synapse we can do etl plus analysis and we know that in order to perform analysis in a faster manner we'll be taking help of a group of computers known as pool and there are two types of pools that we can work with first is sql pool second is spark pool we know the differences between sql pool and spark pool right uh, first difference between sql and spark pool is that in sql pool we follow mpp architecture in spark pool we follow apache spark architecture second difference between sql pool and spark pool is that sql pool supports only one language which is a sql language whereas spark pool supports multiple languages it supports a sql language python language scala language java language and two three more languages okay fine then we learn that sql pools are further of two types first is built in sql pool also known as serverless sql pool second is dedicated sql pool so what is the difference between built in sql pool and dedicated sql pool let's go ahead and let's try to understand it so in built in sql pool what happens is guys you sh whatever analysis has to be done okay the resources for it will be obtained from a shared pool of resources so it's like this let's say you are trying to hire a uber cab and when you hire a uber cab you have two options first is get a shared cab second get a dedicated cab that only will pick up you and will only uh, drop you to your destination right so in uber cabs also we have two type of cabs shared cab dedicated cab here in sql pools also we have two types built in sql pool wherein the resources have to be shared second is dedicated sql pool okay fine so in built in sql pool whatever resources are to be needed let's say when i will try to run my analysis code then whatever resources are to be needed the ram the memory everything uh, will be obtained from built in sql pool okay whereas uh, in a dedicated sql pool what happens is you are not borrowing the resources from a shared pool of resources uh, you will ask azure to uh, you know have a dedicated group of computers made available to you okay and those group of computers will never be shared by anyone fine all right so uh, if anybody asks you the difference between built in sql pool and dedicated sql pool what will you say built in sql pool is like a shared uber cab whereas dedicated sql pool is like a uber cab in only uh, on, uh, in which only you can get in uh, and you will be able to you know get to the destination so just like in uber cabs we have two type of cab shared cab dedicated cab you are also in sql pool you have two types of pools built in sql pool which is like a shared pool and then dedicated sql pool okay so what is the first difference guys between built in sql pool and dedicated sql pool anyone with a difference abhishek buddy can you give me the difference between built in sql pool and dedicated sql pool i gave you one difference up till now what is that i'll give you more differences but up till now one has been shared with you what is that one difference between built in sql pool and dedicated sql pool ha huh. so abhishek is saying in built in sql pool the resources are shared correct and in dedicated sql pool the resources are not shared okay so when you create a dedicated sql pool you will be asking azure to you know give a group of computers dedicated for your usage and those a group of computers will never be shared with anyone okay so this is the first difference let me go ahead and let me mention the difference in another paint window so the difference between built in sql pool and dedicated sql pool built in and dedicated okay let's see built in sql pool and dedicated sql pool so in built in sql pool you are working on a group of computers 
but we are working on a shared group of computers. OK, so we are working on a pool uh, in which you have multiple uh, computers and how many other computers you want. You can get it from that pool, but that pool will be shared by everyone. OK, so whenever you run the code for performing the analysis, then SQ, uh, then what Synapse does is checks that OK, from which pool it can give you those computers that are needed for doing your task. OK, because let's say in one pool that they have created, maybe that pool is, uh, uh, you know, full. I mean, whatever computers were there in that pool were, are being used by someone. So Synapse will try to search the next pool in the Azure. Even that that pool is full, then the third one and so on. OK, so like this, what can happen is sometimes if pools are full, Synapse can take time. OK, sometimes if pools are full, Synapse can take time to find out the pool that is not fully used. OK, previously it used to do that, but now obviously now the algorithm has become better. But previously I remember some years back uh, it used to take a lot of time. OK, but now obviously the algorithm is becoming better and then now they are able to uh, find uh, you know find the pool that is not full in a much faster time okay fine so however traditionally uh, you know built in sql working with built in sql pool used to be very time consuming because synapse had to find out which pool is not fully used and then if that pool is not fully used from that pool it used to give us a group of computers okay Fine. What is dedicated SQL pool in dedicated SQL pool? We will be working on group of computers. That will not be shared with anyone. That will not be shared with anyone. OK, so this is the first difference. What is the second difference? Guys in built in SQL pool, we cannot run any uh, commands like create table command, insert command. Okay, so you cannot run TDL commands, DML commands. TDL stands for, as you know, data definition language. Okay, DML stands for data manipulation language. So, for those of you who don't know, I'll just write it over here that you cannot run commands for creating a table. You cannot run a command for creating. Uh, for inserting rows into a table. You cannot run a command for deleting rows into a table. Deleting rows from a table. OK, so these commands cannot be written in dedicated SQL pool. We can run all the SQL commands. OK. However. There is a limitation. With constraints. There is a limitation with constraints. OK, and what is that limitation that in dedicated SQL pool? Only not null constraint is enforced. OK, only not null constraint. One second, why am I not able to type? Uh, only not null constraint is enforced. While other constraints like uh, primary key constraint, then unique key, a uh, unique constraint, foreign key constraints are not enforced. OK. So in built in SQL pool, uh, you cannot run commands like creating table, inserting rows into a table. OK, uh, you can mostly only run. Your commands for doing query like uh, sorry, doing analysis like uh, select command, right? Select this thing command. Then your group by command and all of those. OK, so I'll just write it over here. that you can only run commands 
to perform analysis. That is your select command. OK, so your select clause, your group by clause. OK, I'll write it fully over here. Your select clause, your group by clause. Your having clause. Your where clause, all of those clauses or all of those commands you can use. OK, but this create table command, insert into table command, deleting rows from a command that cannot work. OK, whereas in dedicated SQL pool, all of your commands will work. The only limitation is with respect to constraints. Fine, so let's talk again about the differences between your built in SQL pool and your dedicated SQL pool. So guys in built in SQL pool. Uh, yes, we are working on a group of computers. But those group of computers will be made available to us from a shared pool. OK, so. Whenever uh, we want to run our code at that time, Synapse will search that OK, which group of computers could be given to them for their task. Once that task is done, then again, those group of computers will be released. So it's like those group of computers never belong to us. Just while executing the code, they are available with us, then they go back to the pool. OK, whereas in dedicated SQL pool, you will be asking Azure to give the group of computers to you. OK, and those group of computers will be never shared by anyone. Even if you are not running the code, still that pool, uh, still those group of computers will be made available to you. OK, whereas in built in SQL pool, once you are done running the code, then those group of computers will be released back into the pool. OK, so that is the first difference. Second difference is what? In built in SQL pool, you cannot run these main DDL and DML commands like create table command, insert into table command, and deleting rows from a table. All of those commands cannot work. Whereas in dedicated SQL pool, all of these commands will work. The only limitation is with respect to constraints. Okay. That primary key constraint, foreign key constraint cannot be enforced. All of these important constraints cannot be enforced. Okay, fine. Let me show you the proof now. I'll go ahead and I'll show you the proof. What I'll do is I'll go to Synapse now. Let me remove the other tabs. OK, let me go into Synapse. Let me launch the studio for Synapse. OK, one student is asking what other topics will be shown. Uh, so just after uh, maybe 20, 30 minutes, we'll move on to Databricks. We'll do one exercise on Databricks. Then at 5 PM, uh, you will have to go through one short assessment test so you can identify uh, as to where you currently stand in um, the field of data engineering with Azure. So in case if you want to attempt the certification, then where do you currently stand? OK, so there will be some questions that will be asked. Uh, some questions will be related to what we learned in the lecture. Some will be. Totally new to that is just to test as to where you currently stand in the uh, for, for the certification of data engineering with Azure. OK, so at 5 PM you will have to do that test. OK, that short assessment. So just uh, after learning for Synapse for 20 minutes, we'll move on to Databricks. See one uh, lab, one exercise on Databricks, and then we'll be done. OK, that then we'll be done for this webinar. OK, anyways, uh, continuing our Synapse journey over here. So I was, as I was telling you that in Synapse, we can do ETL plus analysis both. OK, and for doing analysis, we have pools. I'll go to Manage section and I'll show you pools. OK, here you can see two main type of pools that are there, SQL pool and Spark pool. The other pool just got added right now. It's in preview stage. OK, so it's not fully stable yet, but we'll come to that when, when it is added to the official curriculum of data engineering. OK, but there are two main type of pools. First is SQL pool, second is Spark pool. I'll click on SQL pool, and as I told you, 
there are two types of sql pool built in sql pool also known as serverless sql pool okay second is dedicated sql pool one student is asking after covering synapse will we cover databricks yes as i mentioned that will cover cover one exercise on databricks and that's it just a simple analysis exercise not much okay because this um, webinar is all about giving you an overview of how you can perform data engineering with azure okay so just to we just gave a overview of data factory to you right now i'm giving giving you an overview of synapse to you uh, and then a short overview on databricks that's it okay anyways continuing our synapse journey as i mentioned two main pools you can work with if you want to do analysis sql pool and spark pool within sql pool guys there are two type of pools that you can work with built in sql pool dedicated sql pool as i said built in sql pool is automatically created for you whereas dedicated sql pool is something that you create so let me create a dedicated sql pool okay i'll call it dedicated Uh, SQL pool webinar. Okay, then here, guys, whenever you are creating a dedicated SQL pool, yes, you are asking for a dedicated group of computers that will always be made available to you. But here, you cannot mention the number of computers you want. Here, what you have to do is you have to mention something called DWU units. Okay. You have to mention something called DW units, which is a combination of three things compute, network, and storage. Compute, network, and storage. Okay. So, here, guys, uh, in one unit, some compute will be given to you. That means uh, some, uh, you can say, RAM will be given to you some network will be given to you some networking facilities will be given to you some storage will be given to you in some megabytes or gigabytes now how much is given in one unit that is their proprietary information azure has never released it to public so we don't know in one unit of dwu how much exact compute is given how much exact network is given how much exact storage is given okay but uh, it's like a bundle that comes okay so whenever I ask for one DW unit, I get some amount of compute, some amount of network, some amount of storage. Okay, here you can adjust the amount. You can set it to 1000 DW units, 500, 400, 200 and so on. Okay, up to you, what do you want to set? As you increase the units, more and more compute, more and more storage, more and more network will be added. And obviously more cost also will be added. And this cost is per hour, guys. So accordingly, adjust. Uh, mostly for my projects that I worked with for my clients, I did not have to use more than 400 DWUs. Now, how many DWUs you need for your project? That will depend on your experience. You will have to do trial and error because in one unit, how much compute, how much network, how much storage is there? That is proprietary information. Okay. Some developers try to estimate that maybe. In this W unit, this, this much compute is there, this much memory storage is there, but that is not, um, you can say, correct information. Okay, all of that is just estimation that is floating around on the internet. So, in one DW unit, how much compute, how much storage, how much network is given to us? That is Microsoft's proprietary information. They have not released it to the public. So, how much DW unit for your uh, DW unit you need for your task? It depends on you. I would always suggest to choose the lowest DW unit. And let's say if your uh, uh, analysis is becoming very slow, you can obviously uh, change the DW unit of your dedicated SQL pool later on. Okay, that's fine. But always char so char uh, like start with the lowest one. In my case, even though I have worked with clients and uh, uh, I had to work on, you know, a large, large, files i did not have to use more than 400 dws okay that was my limit i did not have to use more than that fine you have to figure out that in your project how much dw unit you you will have to use okay fine so uh, i'll always recommend it i recommend to start with the lowest the uh okay lowest performance level over here fine 
and let me go ahead and let me create the dedicated sql pool i'll go ahead and i'll create it so just to recap in synapse we know we can do etl plus analysis right in synapse we can do we can do etl plus analysis in data factory we were only able to do etl in synapse we can do etl plus analysis now if i want to do analysis then we have pools available for the same okay that means a group of computers or a pool available for the same okay and there are two type of pools that you can work with first is sql pool second is spark pool we know the difference first is sql pool follows mpp architecture spark pool follows apache spark architecture then in sql pool you have only support for one language which is a sql language in spark pool you have support for multiple languages like sql language uh, python language scala language java language and more okay second difference was that uh, sorry i have already spoke the two differences so fine uh, first difference with respect to architecture second difference was with respect to support of languages okay then sql pool we know is of two types first is built in sql pool also known as serverless sql pool okay second is dedicated sql pool so among these pools i have a question for you among these pools guys which pool is automatically created is it spark pool that is automatically created is it dedicated pool that is automatically created or is it built in sql pool that is automatically created which pool is automatically created as abhishek uh, alim satyabana saying it's the built in sql pool that is automatically created okay whereas dedicated sql pool has to be manually created by you which i did just now just 2 minutes back and spark pool also you have to manually create i will show you later on how to manually create it okay fine and uh, just to show to you and guys uh, now a question what is the difference between a built in sql pool and a dedicated sql pool we know in built in sql pool the we will get a group of computers but they will be shared in dedicated sql pool we'll get a group of computers but they will be dedicated to us they will not be shared by anyone okay yes uh, alim in built in sql pool what happens is you will be charged per query in dedicated sql pool since the group of computers is already available so irrespective of the amount of query you run you have to pay for the entire pool in built in sql pool you will pay per query whereas in dedicated sql pool you will pay for the entire pool irrespective of the amount of query you run whether you run one query or 1000 query in dedicated sql pool you will have to pay same cost whereas in built in sql pool you will pay per query because as i said when you run a query at that time synapse searches for the group of computers in the pool it gives it to the query for execution once the query is complete group of computers are released again when you run the query again synapse searches for group of computers in the pool when the result is obtained of the query the group of computers are released okay so that is what happens in built in sql pool okay kirti says how about data storage sir kirti in built in sql pool you cannot store anything if that's why as i said uh, that's that is the second difference right uh, kirit that uh, in built in sql pool you cannot run these create table commands that means you cannot store anything you can see we have written it over here okay we cannot run these create table commands we so we cannot store anything okay and that's the reason because those group of computers are never like fully available to you as like for a query they will be made available to you once the query result is obtained those group of computers will go back to the pool okay that's why in your built in sql pool you cannot run any code that will save something in the storage so you cannot create a table you cannot insert rows into a table you cannot delete rows into rows from a table you cannot do that you will see that if i try to do it i'll get a error okay let me show that to you so i'll go to develop section 
there i will say please create a file in which i can run sql code okay sql script that means please create a file in which i can run sql code and i will make sure that i am connected to my built in sql pool and let me try to run that query which is create table let's say employee i will have the employee id then employee name let's say okay so let's say two columns employee id and employee name okay fine let me try to run this in my built in sql pool uh, kirit buddy can you let me know buddy over here in my built in sql pool will i be able to run this command will i be able to do it buddy what do you think no right because in built in sql pool we, since the group of computers is never fully available with us okay that's why we cannot do run any command that has a impact on the storage so that we cannot create a table because that will store something in the storage right so fine i cannot run this if i try to run it i'll get an error it says you can see it gives me a error saying that create table command is not supported in in your built in sql pool so let me shift to dedicated sql pool then here i'll connect to my dedicated sql pool you can see i am connected to my dedicated sql pool now now let me try to run this command kirit here can i run this command what do you think buddy yes right here i can run it and if i try to run it you will see it will work and you can see it got successfully executed you can see that over here query got successfully executed here i can run insert command not a issue insert into employees employee and i have columns like uh, emp id emp name EMP ID is let's say one name is let's say Kirit. I'll try to insert into the table and you will see inserting will work. Similarly, I can go ahead and insert more rows. Let's say second row as an employee ID of two. Name is let's say Akash Deep. Okay. In uh, the third row, let's suppose. I have a employee ID of three, and the name is let's say Ali. Okay, and so on. Let me try to run these lines of code also, and they have run. Let me show you how the table looks like. So I'll say select all data from employee table. Okay, and those three rows have been inserted over here. Fine. So now we have proven those differences to you. So two difference, two main differences between built-in SQL pool and dedicated SQL pool. Yes, in built-in SQL pool, you are working on a group of computers. In dedicated SQL pool, also you are working on a group of computers. But in built-in SQL pool, the group of computers are never available to you for the full time. Whenever you will run the query, at that time Synapse will search for group of computers in the pool. They will bring those group of computers to the query. Once the result of query is achieved, those group of computers will be released into the pool. Okay, fine. Whereas in dedicated SQL pool, uh, those group of computers will be available to you for full time. So, uh, irrespective of whether you run a single query or thousand queries in that pool. You will pay for that entire pool irrespective of how many queries you run. Okay, that is what that was the first difference. Second is since in built in SQL pool, the group of computers are never fully available to you. That's why you cannot store anything because even if you try to store anything, once those group of computers go back, then how, how can you retrieve it, right? That's why in built in SQL pool, these commands that, uh, you know, try to do anything with storage like create table command, insert command, delete command, all of those commands cannot work. Whereas in dedicated SQL pool, all of the commands will work. There is only one limitation in dedicated SQL pool. Yes, all of the commands can work, 
but there is one limitation what is that it is with respect to anyone anyone with the answer we know in built in sql pool we cannot run these uh, commands like create table command then insert command delete command we can only run those uh, analysis commands like seal select group and all whereas in dedicated sql pool we can run all commands our only one limitation as saibal and rajkumar has mentioned that there is one limitation with respect to constraints which is that not null constraint is supported but other constraints cannot be enforced you can still write it in your code but they will not be enforced okay they will not be enforced so uh, just to show that to you i'll go ahead and i will show you the documentation one second let me go ahead and i will show you the documentation i'll say synapse constraints supported just to show you okay documentation and you will see over here that it will tell you that you can see it is only supported if it is not enforced if it's not enforced then what is the use okay again unique constraint only supported when not enforced not enforced means even if i write unique constraint it won't have any effect okay so just to show to you uh i'll go ahead and run the code let me do one thing let me drop the table okay and what i will do now is i'll create the table again but this time uh i'll do one thing for employee id i will enter this constraint called unique constraint that means inside this employee id column i can only have unique values so let me create the table let me insert the first row uh, you can see unique is not supported to enforce it you have to sorry to create it you have to mention not enforced keyword so let me write it and then i'll try to insert first row and you will see how your table looks like okay you will see how your table looks like first row has been inserted now let me insert the second row okay this time what i will do over here is for akash deep i am putting a employee id of 1 however here i had mentioned that the employee id should only have unique values however if i try to insert this row for akash deep then employee id of 1 will be inserted this should not be allowed right for a unique constraint but here since i have mentioned not enforce means even though just for my satisfaction i have written it but still that unique constraint won't take into effect so although unique constraint does not allow uh, duplicate values but here it will allow and you can see if i try to run this it will work it will allow duplicate values not a issue okay so it's like what is the use right of uh, using this unique constraint if it's not enforced what is the use why would i waste my time okay and my purpose was to show you the documentation and see that see primary constraint is uh, supported only if not enforced if it's not enforced what is the use okay foreign key constraint is not supported right all right so this was just to show you that yes in built in sql pool we can only run few commands in dedicated sql pool we can run all commands but there is a limitation with respect to constraints okay fine now let's go ahead so Uh, just to ha huh, alim says what it means you mean not enforced not enforced means even though you have written the code to uh, enforce a unique constraint it won't enforce it into the table it's like it's of no use na if it's not enforced then what is the use of me writing this unique constraint if it's not enforced so what is the use so this 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 uh extra code that i wrote was waste that's why i declared it earlier that in dedicated sql pool yes you can write all commands but there is a uh, limit limitation with respect to constraints explained okay fine all right now let's go ahead so alim buddy i just need your help buddy please tell me that we know uh, in data factory we can do etl in synapse we can do etl plus analysis for analysis what are the type of pools that are 
made available to us. For analysis, what are the type of pools that are made available to us? Two types. What are they, buddy? For analysis. No, no, uh -huh. that is for SQL pool. After SQL pool, there is another type of pool, which is Spark pool. Perfect. So Alev has given the correct answer. Spark pool. Okay. Here I'll just go ahead, change the coding file name. I'll just say uh, demo. Okay, if you want to download this file, guys, you can go ahead and click on this export button over here. It will download it for you. Anyways, let's go ahead. And as I told you that, yes, you have SQL pool when you have wherein you have two types built in dedicated. Then you have Spark pool. Let's go ahead and let's create a Spark pool. I'll give it a name. Let's say the name is Spark pool webinar. Okay. It says the name is too long, is it? Fine. Now the name is fine. Uh, I'll just go ahead and fill in the rest of the settings. Isolated compute. If I want to select isolated compute again, I can go ahead and uh, I can select it. Okay. Uh, however, I don't want to do that. I don't want to make my compute isolated from other services. It's fine if it's not isolated from other services, completely fine. Node size family, uh, that means the computers, okay? Nodes, node means computer. So the uh, uh, computers in your family or the computers in your group, okay, will be optimized how? So I will say it should be more memory optimized because I might have to write code related that will communicate more me the memory. Your anyways, only one option is available, memory optimized, if I show you. Oh, sorry, uh, two over there hardware accelerated. So let's say if you want to do more, uh, uh, let's say processing related task, like let's say your you want better um, computation like RAM. Okay, then you can go ahead and make sure that okay, give me those group of computers that are better optimized for RAM. Memory thoda kam bhi hua, chalega RAM zada hona chahiye. Okay, fine. You can go ahead and choose that option. I'll say memory optimized. Okay, because uh, hardware optimized, there will be more costlier. Fine, node size that, okay. Uh, in my case, just like when you buy a computer, right? You check that in your CPU, how many cores you have uh, in your, then how, mu how much memory you have. You can go ahead and select it. So each computer in your family will have how many cores, how much memory. Okay, then auto scale. Uh, if you choose auto scale, then what we'll have to do is uh, you will have to specify a minimum number of computers in the family, maximum number of computers in the family, depending on the workload. The Azure itself will decide how many computers should be made available to you. Okay. Whereas if you disable it, then you will have to specify how many computers are needed. So you can choose three, two as per your own need. Okay. Fine. So uh, let me go ahead and let me set it to three. Okay. If I set it to two, two means what, guys? That one slave, one master computer and one slave computer. Obviously, that configuration is not good. And that's why it will tell me that uh, uh, if I set it to two, it will give me error saying value must be greater than or equal to three. That means one master computer and at least two other slave computers that will make a total of three computers in your family right one master computer and two other slave computers okay fine uh and uh, then uh, in order to do you want to dynamically allocate the executors no uh, it's fine in this case what i do Okay, what it will do is it will make sure that there, there is a concept called executor in Spark architecture. Uh, what it does, it, it is the component of Spark architecture that uh, basically uh, runs your processes. Okay, so do I want to dynamically allocate? No, in that case, I'll just go ahead and disable it. Fine, let me create the Spark pool. And what I will do is once the spark pool is created remember the spark pool is very very costly 
I had my spark pool. Uh, also, the size of the spark pool was little bigger, and I had my spark pool running for a day or so. I forgot to pause it. Okay, there is a way to pause it once it is created. It's still creating right now. Okay, it's still creating. Once it's created, I will show you. There is a button to pause it, and I had forgotten to pause. So what happened is overnight the cost of my spark pool got extended to twenty thousand rupees. Okay, and uh, so remember spark pool is costly uh, make sure that okay if you are not working with it at least pause it if not delete it at least pause it okay and you can see there's a pause button over here to pause it for you okay if you click on this pause button then it will pause it for you fine now let's go ahead and let's use spark pool how to use it uh, we'll go to notebook section and in the notebook section, we'll connect to our Spark pool. So let's connect to our Spark pool over here. And what we can do is we can write our code of analysis one by one. Also, there is a shortcut. I can directly go to the data section, go to the data that is linked with my Synapse. Okay, I can go to the data that is linked with my Synapse. And there, I can just ask it to perform analysis on this data. So I'll say, please load it into notebook. And you can see automatically the code is written for it. I'll just go ahead and run it. OK, first of all, connect to Spark pool and then run it. Remember the first cell. OK, this is called a cell in notebook. This rectangular shape place is called a cell. OK. So when you run your first cell in the notebook, that takes time because uh, it will try to, you know, wake up the spark pool. OK, set all the related settings and everything. So only in your first cell, it will take around uh, two minutes or so. After that, in the upcoming cells, it won't take that much of time. I'll show that to you. However, since this is the first cell that you are executing, it will take around two minutes because it is trying to start the session. OK, it is making sure that the spark pool is connected to this notebook and everything. So main time is for that. OK. Once this first cell runs, then after that. You know, the next cell onwards, it won't take that much of time. So we'll just wait for around two minutes or so. Remember guys that 5 p.m. Uh, you will have to do a small assessment that will tell you where you are actually, uh, you know, in where you currently stand in data engineering with Azure. So you will have some questions that were explained to you in the session. Many of the questions will be outside. So that is just to test you so, so that you can understand where you currently stand. OK, and let's say if you're lagging behind, you would need more preparation on it. Fine, so just a small assessment that you have to do at end. It will hardly take you five minutes or so. OK, just some sample questions. OK, as I said, it takes around two to three minutes, so we'll just wait. It has already taken more than one and a half minute. We'll just wait over here. And like this over here, this is auto generated code, right? Uh, your, you can write your own analysis code as well, up to you. You can do a lot of analysis as you guys know. Right. Um, some of you Python developers, SQL developers would know the code for doing analysis. You can do that over here. Remember, uh, in your Spark pool, you can write code in multiple languages, not just Python language, but also SQL language. So let's say if you want to write code in SQL, you will just write percentage percentage SQL, and below that you will write your SQL code. So you select star from whatever. Okay. That is how you can write code in SQL language. By default, if you do not write percentage percentage something, by default it assumes that you are writing code in Python language. If you're writing code in any other language, you have to mention in the top of the cell that okay, that the bill uh, now in this cell I'll be writing code in SQL language. Fine. 
So it has taken around three minutes. It's still starting. As I said, it takes two to three minutes. Then from the next cell onwards, it won't take that much time. We'll just go ahead, wait for a few minutes over here. And we should see our result. I just wait. It takes two to three minutes minimum. As you can see here, it's taking more than that also. But two to three minutes is minimum. Okay. The session is ready. Now it should execute. Main time goes in uh, making the session ready. Can we achieve? Huh? Yes, yes, Alim, you can do that. Absolutely. Can do that. We'll just go ahead, we'll wait. And now it should be done within five, 10 seconds. Let's see. Whenever it takes two to three minutes to start the session. Huh. And now it's trying to display the result. Let's see. Okay, it ran. And now what I will do is. Uh, currently, the column names were not treated correctly as column names. So what I will do is I will just uncomment this code and say header equal to two. I'll just go ahead and write the code. And this uh, cell won't take that much of time. Okay, previous cell, since it was the first cell, as I said, it took it took many minutes to run. This one won't take that much of time. Okay, and you can see the result over here. Fine, now you can do analysis, a lot of analysis, just like how you normally do in Python language or so. Okay, fine. So guys, uh, with this, we learned that, okay, in Synapse, uh, you can do ETL plus analysis. As far as analysis is concerned, uh, you have to do it on a group of computers called pool. Within pool, you have two types of pools, SQL pool, Spark pool. SQL pool is of two types again, built-in SQL pool, dedicated SQL pool. Built-in SQL, and what is the difference between built-in SQL pool and dedicated SQL pool? Well, in built-in SQL pool, you share the group of computers from the pool. In dedicated SQL pool, the group of computers are given to you for your usage. You won't have to share it with anyone else. In built-in SQL pool, you cannot run your uh, commands that will impact the storage. Like create table command, you cannot run. Insert command, you cannot run. Delete command, you cannot run. Whereas in dedicated SQL pool, you can run all commands. The only limitation is with respect to constraints. So that was about different types of SQL pools, right? Now, uh, what is the difference between SQL pool and Spark pool? We know in SQL pool, we follow MPP architecture. In Spark pool, we follow Apache Spark architecture. In MPP architecture, the limitation is there is no replication of data among the worker computers. Whereas in Spark pool, there is replication of data among the worker computers. Okay, so we have seen uh, some work with all the type of pools over here. This was just the overview of what you can do. Okay, uh, fine. So guys, is the overview of Synapse clear to you? What Whatever we did up till now, did it make sense? Alim is saying, can, okay, what are the software for on-premises? So if you want to publish anything on-premises, uh, within Azure only, there are services that will help you to do that. There is no external software that you have to work on. Okay. So you have to see that uh, whatever you want to uh, do on, on, on premises is there, for example, uh, what I did for my client was, let's say uh, um, what they wanted to do was instead of using SQL database that is there on Azure, they wanted to work on uh, on premises SQL database. Okay, so Azure had that capability that okay, uh, they are 
Azure SQL database, they can shift to on premises. So you will have to see the service within Azure. Okay, there is no other uh, external software that will help you. Informatica, uh, of equivalent of what? It's not equivalent to either of uh, Synapse or Data Factory. Informatica is on premises, but it's not equivalent to that. And with that, uh, you cannot do the migration of this data factory to your own premises. Okay. Okay, fine. So this was just the overview, guys, just to help you understand uh, the services related to data engineering. First was your, uh, uh, what was the first service that we saw? Data factory service, right? And second service that we saw was Synapse service. Okay. Third service now, moving on to the third one. At 5 p.m., you will have a short uh, assessment. Moving on to our third service, which is Databricks. Okay, so as I said in Databricks, it's used mainly for analysis, but you can do analysis in a much faster way. If you remember, in Synapse, you can see for analysis how much time it was taking. Okay, how much time it was taking. Whereas in Databricks, you can, it, it will be done in a much faster way. Okay. In uh, Synapse, I'll run the code again. You will see it was taking some good amount of time. Okay, this is fine because I run the same piece of code. So it had stored the output in cache only. But previously, you remember it took around 10 seconds for this cell. For this cell, though, it took around four to five minutes. But in Databricks, the same analysis will be able to do, but in a much faster way. How? Let's see. All right. So what I will do is before proceeding ahead, just to lower my cost, I'll make sure that uh, I delete my uh, synapse. Okay, because in synapse, I've created these pools and these pools are very costly and I hardly have some credits left in this uh, subscription. So let me go ahead and let me delete it. I don't want to incur more cost. Along with Synapse Data Factory also I will delete. Although it is not that costly, but still. Go ahead and delete that. That has been deleted. You can see I hardly have some credits left. Okay, and uh, I need to do all of my lectures in those credits. Okay, on 22 or 23 February, maybe Azure will uh, refill those credits back to me. But fine, at least for next five or six days, I have to work with those credits only. That's why I'm just deleting all the resources that we are done with. I don't want to keep them waiting. I'm done with this. Okay, it's been deleted. Fine, all right. So it will do that deletion process in. All right, now main service, for, which is our Databricks service. OK, let's go ahead. Now in Databricks, uh, you do analysis, you Apache Spark architect. You might wonder that was available in apps also. OK, but guys, there is a difference. OK, let's try to understand. Guys, uh, who so the person who worked on the person who made actual Apache Spark, right? OK, uh, he wanted to commer commercialize it. So what he did was in order to commercialize it, he created this product called Databricks. OK, so Databricks is a product that is created by the person who made that uh, uh, Apache Spark architecture. OK, so in Databricks, what happens is since your Apache Spark architecture is fully integrated with it, OK, whereas in Synapse, what is happening is uh, you are trying to follow the Apache Spark architecture. However, uh, it's not made by the person who actually created Apache Spark. So it's like you can say uh, you are trying to, uh, tr you know, uh, get the uh, performance of Ferrari, but it's not made by actual Ferrari company. OK, 
So obviously you will create a replication of it. The replication might work fine. It, it might do the job or so. Okay. But it will still not be equal to original Ferrari, right? So Databricks is that original Ferrari there. Uh, that product is made by the person who worked, who made the actual Apache Spark architecture. Okay. So there you can say that uh, Apache Spark architecture is fully built in into Databricks. Okay. That is one reason. Second reason also I will show you why data in Databricks the analysis is faster. Okay. Why in Databricks the analysis is faster. And that is the main reason. Okay. Here, this was just to give you a history behind Databricks that okay in Databricks, it's made by the person who actually built the Apache Spark architecture, whereas Synapse is not. That's fine. Okay. But what is the main reason behind, uh, you know, uh, such a good performance of Databricks? Let's see. So what I will do is I'll go ahead, try to create a Databricks resource. Let me go ahead and do that. I'll choose a resource group over here, give it a name. Let's say test Databricks. Okay, pricing tier, I'll keep it uh, standard. Okay, uh, just like in Synapse, we have managed resource group. Managed resource group means what? That let's say I give a task to Synapse uh, to perform and the require the resources that it requires for that task. Let's say those resources are not available. So Synapse will automatically create those resources for us. And those resources that it automatically creates will fall on the managed resource group. Same thing is with Databricks. In Databricks also, you have the concept of managed resource group. Fine, we'll keep it empty. I'll directly go to review plus create. And let me go ahead and create it. The rest of the settings I'll keep the same. I will directly create Databricks over here. Okay. It is creating. We'll just wait for some time. And soon the creation should be over. Once the creation is over, we'll see what to do next. Now, going ahead, uh, Akashdeep, just a question to you, buddy. Akashdeep, uh, what is data factory used for, buddy? You already know, but just so that with your answer, other people can revise. Uh, Akashdeep mentioned data factory used for ETL. Perfect. Then, buddy, what is uh, Synapse used for? Synapse is used for? Synapse is used for ETL plus analysis. Perfect. Then what is Databricks used for? Purely analysis, right? Databricks is purely used for analysis. Okay. Now once we had written earlier that, uh, yes, we can perform modeling over there. Yes, but what is the main goal after performing modeling to perform analysis, right? The main goal over there to create models is what? Let's say I create a model to predict stock price. At the end of the day, what is the goal of my machine learning model? The goal of any machine learning model is to perform analysis at the end of the day. That okay, maybe going into the future, what would be the estimated price of this stock or something like that. Okay, so Databricks is at the end used for analysis. Okay, fine. Now you directly perform analysis on data or you do modeling, then perform analysis on data. At the end of the day, you are doing analysis. Okay, we'll just wait for Databricks to create Databricks resource to create and then we'll see what to do next. Let's just wait. We'll go ahead, wait for it. And after that, I'll show you what to do next. It is still creating. It will take around two to three minutes. To create. Uh, correct me for yes, it's only using that Apache Spark architecture. OK, you only using a uh, Spark pool and in Spark pool we follow Apache Spark architecture. Now in Spark pool, obviously you can run multiple languages, right? Python language, SQL language, uh, Java language, Scala language. So you can write code in multiple languages, but the pool that will be used is Spark pool. In Spark pool, the architecture that is used is Apache Spark. So yes, 
Okay, the only way that you can do analysis over there is Apache Spark architecture. Synapse supports create AIMN models. And if you remember uh, in Synapse, I guess that resource is uh, over. If you remember when I opened the pipeline, there was an option, there was an activity called machine learning. Okay, so if you expand it, you will see activities to perform machine learning operations over there itself. Okay, so there in that pipeline itself, you will have options to perform machine learning operations. Okay. Uh, any link? Okay, I'll I'll make sure to send a link to you later. Okay. Fine. Uh, let me go to this Databricks resource, guys. It's created now. So I'll go ahead and go to the Databricks resource. I'll launch the workspace. And uh, what I will do is uh, it is trying to sign in. So we'll just wait. After that, I'll show you what to do. So as one student asked in Databricks, uh, we'll only be able to work on a, a Spark pool. Yes. So let's create a Spark pool first. OK, so how to create a Spark pool? Pool is also known as cluster. OK, one and the same thing. Spark pool, Spark cluster, one and the same. So if I want to create a Spark pool or if I want to create a Spark cluster, how would I do it? Let's see. So I'll go to compute section over here on the left hand side and I'll say create compute. OK, what will I do over here? I'll say just create compute. So let me go ahead and uh, let me create a compute over here. And in this scenario, I'll just go ahead and uh, make sure to run uh, to fill in the required details. OK, so everything I'll keep default over here. Uh, the latest stable version. Uh, everything I'll keep it the same. OK, photon acceleration is uh, just introduced right now. OK. It just makes sure that uh, it is built on top of Apache Spark architecture and it makes sure that the analysis is even more faster. However, it will be costly. So I'm unselecting it. If you want to select it, you can. However, it's costly. I'll unselect it. OK, it is uh, introduced uh, recently. OK, then worker type. So each computer in that cluster will be of what size? 14 GB of memory, four cores of CPU. OK, then uh, the driver that main computer right so the uh, master computer that will be of which size so first option is to set configuration settings for your uh, worker computers if you remember in synapse was that option available their overall option was available that okay select the type of computer but which computer master computer then or worker computer there was no such configuration available Whereas in Databricks, there is such configuration available because as I said, Databricks is made by the person who created actual Apache Spark architecture. OK, so he has put in all of these customizations. Fine, so you can set the customization of the driver computer or the master computer. OK, next is worker computer. Fine, then how many workers you want? Minimum two, maximum eight, all of that. Fine. I'll just go ahead and create a compute over here, which is nothing but I've created a spark pool. OK, I've created a spark pool. Remember, guys, that another advantage of Databricks is oh, you can also do live collaboration in your team. So you're at set access mode to single user. But let's say if you have more people in your team, you want to collaborate. You want to give the same pool to someone else in your team later on. You can do go ahead and do it. You can change the access mode at that time. OK, but fine. I didn't want to change the access mode I, since I don't have any team members to share it with. OK, that's why I set it to single users. That is the advantage of Databricks. Yes, you can run your Spark pool. OK, you could run it in Synapse also. It's just that in Databricks, you can execute it in a much faster manner. I'll show you. You yourself will see the time. OK, second is there is a lot of collaboration that you can do among the team members. Let's say you created a pool. That pool you want to share it with other members in your team. You can go ahead and do that. OK, so it's completely up to you. Uh, we'll just wait for it to create that spark pool or spark cluster. And then I'll show you what to do next. Let's just wait.
so first difference between uh, your uh, spark pool in uh, databricks and spark pool in synapse is that in databricks we have lot of configuration options for spark pool so there uh, in uh, databricks you can set the configuration for your master computer separately and your worker computer separately right whereas in synapse you just had to mention the configuration of your overall computer it was not allowed to you that for master computer you set a different size for worker computer you set a different size no so that is the first difference what is the second difference the second difference is that let's say you created a spark pool in synapse you could not share it with other members in your team whereas in databricks that collaboration of option is available okay you can share it with the with other members in your team so that collaboration option is available over there Okay, we'll just wait over here. Uh, so Mayfor has a question. Mayfor says for Azure analysis, can, you can use Synapse or Databricks, but for OLTP analysis. Uh, for OLTP workloads, yes, you run, huh, correct. Yes, so I, you would, I would not prefer Synapse for that. You're absolutely correct. For OLTP workloads, you will just use I don't need. I would definitely not use Synapse. Neither Databricks for that matter. You're absolutely right. For OLTP workloads, you're absolutely right. Okay, although guys, uh, if you will see the official curriculum of DP203, uh, so you're absolutely right, Mayfer, with the fact that for OLTP workloads, it seems Synapse is not fully capable because the SQL pools in Synapse are not fully capable for OLTP workloads. But guys, let's say you create an external sql database you can even connect it to your uh, synapse so let's say you wanted to perform a oltp workload now the sql pools within synapse are obviously not sufficient i agree but what if you create a separate sql database in azure outside of synapse let's say a normal sql database and you connect it with synapse you can do it so if i just show to you the official labs of dp203 there you will see a lab will be there. Okay. It says, huh, here, use Azure Synapse link for SQL. So you will create an external SQL database and connect it with Synapse. Okay. So for OLTP workload, I believe this will be more preferable for you. Okay. So try to use this option. It's available in the, uh, you can follow the documentation if you want to. Okay. Uh, it's available in the official, you can say, the official labs of DP203. Okay. How about Azure Analysis Services? Which services? Which specific services are you talking about? Acha, you are saying for that, use Synapse or Databricks, like normal analysis? Is that what you are asking for normal analysis? What will we, what will do in Azure? For normal analysis, if you are asking, I would always prefer uh, Synapse. Okay, uh, because most of my work that I have done with clients, I've found Synapse to be a lot of better. Okay, I mean, let's say I wanted to run SQL code, I can use SQL pools for doing an analysis. Uh, for OLTP workloads, as I said, you can create an external SQL database connected with Synapse. My OLTP workloads, I was also able to do. Also, any machine learning models that I was able, wanted to make, I can just create a notebook in Synapse and create any machine learning model. So what I have found is, if you want all-in-one service, Synapse is better. Is that what you're asking? Okay, but let's say if you just wanted to work on machine learning, okay, wherein the you wanted to the code to perform faster, okay, you want to perf use machine learning for analysis. Obviously, for machine learning, we want the code to run faster. In that case, I would not prefer Synapse. I would prefer Databricks. Okay, fine. I hope whoever asked that question, I could not see your name as it's written as unknown user, but I hope. Uh, your doubt is clear. OLTP, I mean, yes, as I mentioned, you can use SSAS. Okay. 
but what i'm saying is for my clients whatever i worked with i have always linked external sql database with my synapse and there only i have done my work i have found it to be a lot easier you can use it use traditional sss like one student has mentioned okay but the approach that i have used is i have always used synapse and i have found it to be easier so i would suggest you to first try it okay you yourself will find it easier as well okay obviously different people will have different preferences i prefer synapse more okay fine anyways uh depends on the preference all right let's go ahead and what i will do now is um, let me go ahead and let me try to use this uh, spark pool or spark cluster and let me write some analysis code so what i will do over here is let me click on new button and create a notebook and what i will do is i'll try to first of all download a file okay so this is products.csv let me go ahead and let me save it okay i have saved it here is the file okay one second this was movies let me cut this uh, open products here it is okay fine now what i want to do is i want to upload it over here so obviously i can upload it to my storage account right just like how we did it with data factory with synapse that okay my data was in storage account then the data that is there in storage account we are uh, using it in data factory the data that is there in the storage account we are using it in synapse the data that is there in storage account you can use in data bricks also but in data bricks there is additional facility available okay uh, and what is that there is something called dbfs okay it is something called dbfs guys okay so with dbfs what happens is called data bricks file system so instead of uploading data somewhere else and getting it from there whatever data you want to work with in databricks you directly upload to dbfs file system okay with that what will happen is the latency will be low okay so instead of uploading it on any other storage account or any other place uh, you just upload it to dbfs with that your analysis will become lot faster because dbfs is built on top of uh, databricks only okay so your latency to get data from the files and dbfs will be much much lesser as compared to any other place okay anyways uh, what i'll do now is uh, let me go ahead and i'll do one thing let me click on file button and i'll say it should be a option over here upload huh? upload data to dbfs here it is okay and i'll go ahead and i will upload my data the one that i just downloaded here it is i have uploaded it to dbfs okay it is just uh, giving me the code that okay if i want to uh, you know basically use the code uh, to read the file later on then how would i be using the code okay so i'll just copy this code over here okay fine and let me go ahead i'm done with it okay and the same code that i copied let me put it over here and what i will do is i'll just go ahead and run this piece of code and let's see it will try to load the data into the file okay and then i'll just try to go ahead and show you the data in that particular file okay you can see how much shorter time it took guys whereas in synapse when i was running my code it was taking much much longer it took the first cell itself took uh, four minutes or so you can see in data bricks it's much faster okay you can see how how much faster it is okay just in one or one second or so i am able you can see the command took how much 0 0.80 seconds here it is shown okay is this that the first cell was um, trying to wake up the spark cluster so obviously that will take more time but in uh, synapse even that first cell took 4 minutes or 4 and a half minutes here it just took 16 seconds then in synapse the second cell when i was trying to display that data frame to you it took around 10 to 15 seconds here it took just 0 0.80 seconds okay and then after that you can do your analysis like you want okay 
let's uh, let me go ahead and let me uh, show that uh, analysis to you okay so for example suppose i am just storing it as a view okay let me go ahead and let me store the data as a view or as a let, let me just store it as a table let's say save as table so that I can then work with it using SQL code because as I said in your notebook, you can write code in SQL language also. So first let me save it as a table. Save as table. And I'm creating a table called products. So going forward, I can go ahead and do analysis on it. And you will see that once I am done, okay, once the execution is complete, what next to do, I will show that to you. Okay, it is done. Uh, now what I will do guys is I will just go ahead and I will try to run my analysis code. Okay, let's say I'm writing code in SQL. So I have already created this table. So one student is asking how to store it as a table in Databricks. OK, I have already written this code over here to store it as a normal table. OK, so that I can work with it using SQL language. If you do not want to work with it using SQL language, no need to create this type of table. OK, I'll say select product name, list price from this products table. Where uh, let's say my category category uh, is equal to touring bikes. Okay, and this is our SQL code. Let me go ahead and let me run it. Uh, sorry, uh, single percentage SQL, my mistake. And after this, it should work. And it should give me the analysis. Here. So like this, you can do analysis. Here it tells me that, okay, uh, what were the products uh, names and the list price of those products were categories touring bikes. Okay, if you want to view information of all the products, you can go ahead and do that as well. You will just say select star from products. You can do group by operation, whatever you want, you can do it. As I told you guys that you uh, notebooks has a capacity uh, capability to not only write code in Python language, but SQL language in Java language. You can go ahead and do it. Scala language. Okay, fine. So guys, this was just a simple overview of the third data engineering service, Databricks service. Okay. Uh, up till now, we have got overview of three services. OK, the first service was your. Uh, our, what was the name? Data factory service, right? The one that we saw. The second service was your uh, Synapse service and the third service was Databricks service. OK, so these were the three services that we saw overview of. I hope the overview is clear to you. OK. Now Abhishek has a doubt. Abhishek can support any file format. Is that what you are asking? I think that was what you mentioned, right? Because DBFS itself is a system. So I guess you are asking any file format. Yes. Okay. So just like your normal blob storage account can store any type of files, here you can upload any type of files. Up to you. Okay. One student is asking how to store it as a table. I've already shown. Okay. And uh, where to view DBFS files and DBFS tables. All you have to do is run code. Okay, there is no physical place where you will be able to see there. Okay, you will have to run code. Just like, for example, let's say I want to view databases. What do we do? We say show databases. Okay. Similarly, if I want to view tables or if I want to anything, we just have to write code. There is no physical place uh, where we'll be able to see the tables listed. Just like how in a SQL database we see the tables listed, right? On the left hand side, so there is no physical place like that. Okay, where and how to view? Okay, uh, I'll show you the documentation. It will take you around, uh, you know, ten minutes to configure the settings for the same. I'll send you the documentation. 
I'll make sure uh, to search it for my repository and send the documentation to you. So that accordingly do your task. OK, fine. So that is it for today, guys. This was just the overview of what you can do in Azure as far as data engineering is concerned. Guys, did it make sense? Was it of some value to you? I hope you learned something. Uh, OK, yes, OK. Thank you. All right. So that was it for today. Uh, so guys, um, I guess Archie has already uploaded the assessment form. So just try to fill it up. OK. And uh, that will be it for today. This was just a short overview session. Uh, ahead, we'll have more sessions that will dive more into each of these services. OK, this was just a short overview. Uh, Mayfer, you can check the recording uh, in your mails. Shortly, a mail will be sent to you. Also, I guess uh, it's available. It will be available on our YouTube channel also. Uh, although Archie will be able to better guide you. OK, I'm not sure. Uh, previously, we used to send mails. I don't know. Maybe they have changed the system. But it's definitely uploaded on official YouTube link. Yes, thank you, Bhaskar. Thank you, Akash. Thank you, Abhishek, Rajkumar, Mahindra. We have Malika Arjun. Yes, thank you. Kirit, Satyaban, uh, Vicky. Okay, thank you, everyone. All right, so that's it for today, guys. Thank you for attending and bye. Bye, everyone. Have a, have a great day. Thank you, sir, for this insightful session. Guys, I already shared feedback form, so make sure you will fill this feedback form before leaving the session. If you like the session, please fill this feedback form. Guys, before leaving the session, make sure you will fill this feedback form. Only the bubble. Then the guy's cola.